Chair of the Rotary Honors Scholars Committee. Unfortunately, today, President Jean is unable to join us as she and Dr. Fauci both tested positive for COVID. And it's, I mean, it really, I mean, you know, this, you know, anyway, um, we will wish Jean well. She wishes she could be here. She gives her regrets and her best wishes to both candidates. Um, this was one of the meetings she was really looking forward to. So, uh, you know, COVID's a, it's, it's been terrible. But uh, anyway, we wish Gene a speedy recovery. To provide our invocation today is Andrew Holden, Wolf Division President of National Park National Bank and a Paul Harris Fellow. Welcome, Andrew. Good afternoon. Please pray with me. Creator and sustainer of all that is or will ever be, accept our thanks for this day and all of its blessings. We ask that you guide and direct our club, its leaders, and our actions. Grant that each of us may feel our responsibility of Rotary to our community and to our country. Bless our fellowship today and bless the, this food to the nourishment of our bodies in your service. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. And now we have to lead us in the four-way test and the Pledge of Allegiance, Josh Shooter. Suter, the Chief Executive Officer at the Chamber of St. Matthews. Welcome, Josh. Zoe, in the pledge, please. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I can pull that thing way down. If you'll join me in the uh, four-way test. Is it true? Is it a very tall concern? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you, Josh, and, and Rotarians and guests, please be seated. Rotarians, please take this time to introduce yourself first, then your guests or guests. Yes, please stand and be recognized when your name is called. I know we've got a lot of guests here. There's so much energy in the room because there's people in the room. Thank you, everybody that's here. Yes, my name is Lewis Singer, private banking with Republic Bank. My guest today is Gary Spence, private banking with Republic Bank. Well, I'm Fred Cowan. Um, my guest today is Steve Miller, who's a distinguished attorney and a longtime campaign consultant who has been key architect of many campaigns in Kentucky, including the election of Brandon Jones for governor. Hi, I'm Susan Zapane, and my guest today is State Representative Nina Kokarni. Hi, 
Good afternoon, Walt and fellow Rotar Rotarians. This is Angie Bailey with Excel Services, and my guest today is Ashu Nayak, who's process engineer with our company. Good afternoon, I'm Kent Wayland, and my guest today is uh, founder and chief strategic officer Bill Wayland, also my father. Uh, hello, almost the president of Walt. Uh, Tommy Crimmins here, and my guest is Ramona Butler, owner of Gym Guys, and uh, my good friend. Hi, President-elect Walt. Uh, my name is Erica Fields of Brooks Green, and my guest is my wife, Patience Fields. I'm Dr. Swanee Jett. CEO of Park of All Community Health Centers, and today I have Ms. Najiba Shine, Chief of Human Resources. And I'm Tom Bonert, and uh, my guest today is Jack Will, who is Executive Director of the uh, Jefferson County League of Cities. Good afternoon, everyone. Deline Taylor, Executive Director of the club. It's been a little bit of a hectic day, so unfortunately I did not write down all of the names and or titles and um, companies of our guests, so please shout it out when you stand up. Uh, Yvette De La Guardia. Hi, I'm a local attorney running for Jefferson County District Court. Okay, local attorney running for Jefferson County District Court. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also have... Um, Let's see here, um, Jackie Jones. Thank you. Kim Jones, is she here? Okay. Uh, Ryan Paxton. Commercial lender with Fort Bank. Ward Wilson. Where are you at, Ward? I'm executive director of Kentucky Waterways. Weston Burchett, did he make it yet? Um, Earl Weinbrenner. And then we have, hang on one second, I know I have someone else here. Uh, Margaret and Rebecca, where are you guys at? <laughs> Is there anyone else that um, came at my invitation that I failed to invite? Please stand up really quickly. All right, thank you guys. Hello, uh, Judd Hendricks with Interfaith Pass the Peace. My guest is the fairly new uh, Rabbi Ben Freed, who is the new uh, Rabbi at uh, Kinesis Israel. So welcome. <laughs> I'm David Snyder with New Directions. We have a guest at our table from the Suburban Rotarian. Ross Brown. Ross, welcome. Thank you. And Ross is already president-elect of his club, so that, uh, anyway, he walked in and took leadership. That's really, really cool. Guests and Rotarians, please encourage your guests to see Craig Sherman. Craig loves to hide around. Where's Craig? I think he's in the back corner back here. What is Rotary immediately following the meeting? Thank you, Craig. Now I'd like to welcome Mike Cool, past president of 2005 and 6, lifetime service award winner, major donor, Paul Harris Society member, Rotary Foundation committee chair, and one of the best darn past presidents we've ever had to the stage. opportunity to honor Erica and Patience Fields, who have generously contributed to the Rotary Foundation and in doing so have achieved major donor status. 
Because of their dedication to the Rotary Foundation, we honor them today with major donor level one recognition. Thank you, Erica, and Patience, for this support. So much good begins with your generosity. You give to others, knowing their not knowing their stories, their faces, or even their names. In so doing, you demonstrate through your generous act that all fellow human beings are worthy of our compassion. Your act of kindness is a seed of peace that will yield returns for not only the community served by your generosity, but from Rotary as a premier foundation and organization. You are among a dedicated and select group of humanitarians who have committed themselves to serving others. Major donors change the lives of children, young people, adults, communities, and the world to which we all belong. Erica and Patience, please come forward and accept our congratulations. Your gift inspired others to give, not just of their treasure, but of their time and of their talent. In recognition of your investment in the Rotary Foundation's wonderful projects and programs, I present this crystal and major donor pins on behalf of the Rotary Foundation <coughs> trustees. I joined because I had neighbors and friends that were in Rotary, and I saw what it meant to them. And I was involved in international business, so whenever I traveled around the world, I'd see the Rotary sign in hotels and meeting places. And when I found out how much the Rotary Foundation does, how much leverage it gives each club, each district, and everyone in Rotary to create projects that, that really affect people. The first one I was involved in, we set up banks for small farmers in Peru, and being in the ag business myself, it just meant a lot to me. So we decided to uh, continue our involvement as, as donors and members of the Paul Harris Society. So thank you, this is really an honor, and I'm just glad I can help our district, our club, and, and everyone in Rotary. Um, I am planning on doing it at some point, um, but I was in the Minneapolis um, Rotarian Club, uh, which was 51% women. Um, so I'm happy to see so many women here today. So let's applaud all the women in Rotary. Again, I'd like to thank Eric and Patience for their generous contribution. What Rotary does does make a difference. Now, with that, I'd like to invite Julie Schmidt to the podium. And today, Rotary, the Downtown Rotary Club of Louisville, has the privilege to host a mayor mayoral candidate forum. I'd like to welcome today Julie, who's a Paul Harris Fellow. She's Senior Director of External Affairs at Kentucky Educational Television. She's our immediate past president, and as we like to say, one of the darn best past presidents we've ever had, and chair of the Rotary Fund of Louisville to the, to the stage at this time. Thank you, Julie. Well, good afternoon. We are most appreciative to have the two candidates for mayor with us today for this special program. As part of the world's largest humanitarian organization, the Rotary Club of Louisville, chartered 110 years ago, in fact, June 14, 1912, is the date we organized, but we don't take political positions. However, we do care very deeply about our community, and we believe that being informed, educated on the issues, 
and really understanding uh, each other, providing a platform for civic dialogue is of utmost importance. So we are truly grateful to have the opportunity to hear directly from our two outstanding candidates for mayor as they share their vision for the city and the region that we so proudly call home. I am honored to introduce the mayoral candidates and in alphabetical order we have um, the opportunity to meet Republican candidate Mr. Bill Durif. He is mayor of the city of Jefferson Town, now serving in his 12th year. Mr. Durif is the previous owner of Durif Hardware that his daughter and son-in-law now operate. He has a very long list of civic and business organizations in which he's been involved and held leadership positions. And so um, I know you want to hear from the candidates, so we'll just leave it at that. So thank you for your service. And meet Democratic candidate. And meet Democratic candidate Craig Greenberg, an attorney. He helped start and build 21C Museum Hotels. And he's been involved in numerous organizations. And in fact, he's been a leader in urban renewal and historic preservation in our community and many others. He too has been active in the community and has served on many boards and organizations uh, related to civic, education, and health related organizations. So thank you for your service. Now I want to share what the format will be. So each candidate will have five minutes to share their vision for Louisville and why they would make the best person to serve as mayor of our beloved city. We will flip a coin and walk, who knows going to do that, to determine who goes first. Following their remarks, we have uh, questions that have already been submitted by Rotarians. So we will um, go in the order in which um, they go and flip it so it's fair and equitable. The response time will be two and a half minutes, and we have Ashley Brower up front. She it will be our timekeeper, so they will be aware of how much time is available. And then we'll wrap up the program as they can share and uh, remarks at that close. So um, without further ado, the coin toss, President Elect Wall. I appreciate you, Joe. So I, I was trying to find an interesting coin, and I think I did it because we, we're the we're the king of bourbonism here in Louisville. We have an old Forster coin with old Forster on the back and Marvin Brown on the front. So Mr. Brown will be the heads and old Forster will be the tail. So and then you, you win and you decide which one will go first or second. COVID, we go, oh, they just had COVID. But how many people have passed away over the last couple of years because of COVID? But right now, I've seen some that we hope everybody just gets it and just gets over it in a day or two. But let's, let's give our prayer and say we hope Gene West gets well and he's back here very soon. As I, as I meet different people and talk to different people around this community, the one thing, whether it's a resident or a business that I hear, is they want to hear from a successful, proven mayor to lead the next city. They want to have the city that's ready day one for somebody that's been doing it for 12 years as a nonpartisan mayor. We have to unite the city to where we are working together in totality. No matter if it's downtown, west end, east end, or southwest, we have to unite everybody moving forward. And as the mayor of Jefferson Town, I was also the president of Kentucky League of Cities. As, as we were mentioned, I have a list of different things, but as the Kentucky League of Cities president, I was one that led both all 416 cities across the state, including Louisville. And this was during the pandemic, and during that time, I, I visited 187 cities because people wanted to know what we were going to look like when we came out of the pandemic. They needed reassurance. They needed immunity. So as we look across this community, I have worked this whole state. 
I have worked with different representatives and also have worked downtown with the Metro Council, whether they're Democrat or Republican. Because many times they would call and say, hey, can you help us with a bill? Or can you help us with Frankfurt? It'd be nice to have somebody that walks in Frankfurt and is not being fought at, that has been always worked with, with both Democrats and Republicans. Because as a mayor right now, I am a nonpartisan mayor. But as a mayor, I took over a city that was $17 million in debt, and we refinanced that and paid that off in 11 years early and saved a million dollars, and we didn't raise taxes. But we also put a surplus in the bank that had $25 million where we're using part of it to build an amphitheater and a new police department to provide you the police that you deserve in this community, place in Jacob. And an amphitheater because the next generation doesn't want the golf courses. They want the amenities to where they can relax and enjoy our community, to be part of this community. So as a future attraction of the young generation, we need to sell what we have and promote what we have. I've always said I am tired of being the one that says I want to be like somebody else. Everybody keeps saying I want to be like Indianapolis. I want to be like Nashville. I want to be like Louisville. Let's start being leaders and quit being followers and take what they have and make it better and be the city that we can. We have the people here that we can grow the city in the future. We can grow it now, and we can make this the greatest city ever can be. The key thing is we campaign. Everybody keeps talking about safety, 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 economic development, and education. And we'll probably hit on those as we go through the different questions. But I'll let you know I live this every day. And so as we, as we look to the future, it's nice to have somebody that has 12 years of successful proven experience that's an accountant that understands what the numbers mean and knows how to read a financial statement because from my understanding the Metro Council has a lot of free money right now and they're spending it but come a year from now what I understand they're going to be 70 million dollars in debt and in the future possibly 100 million dollars in debt so let's look to somebody that can represent you that can unify you and make this a place where you can be proud to raise your grandkids somebody asked me why do you want to be the next mayor of Louisville because I love what I do. I've done it for 12 years successfully. But the key thing is, I want to do this for my grandkids. My grandkids live here now. I want them to stay here. I want them to grow here. And I want their families to want to be here. At the end of my term, I want you to be able to tell somebody that says, where should I move? Where should I be? I want you to say, look, it's the best place in the United States, best place in the world that you can ever be. Right now, you may not want to say that to people, but why? But right in, in four years from now, on January 1, actually, you're going to be able to tell people this is the place to be. Thank you all, and I appreciate everybody being here today. Good afternoon. How are you all today? It's great to be with all of you all here today at the Rotary Club. Special shout out to my wife, Rachel, who I'm joined, is joining us here today, and also your fellow Rotarian and my campaign chair, Barbara Sexton-Smith. It's great to be with you all. I grew up in Louisville and have loved Louisville ever since my family moved here when I was a young boy. I'm a proud graduate of Jefferson County Public Schools. I was proud for the work that I did on the University of Louisville Board of Trustees, working to transform that important institution in our community to bring more transparency and reform to that organization and set it on the great course that it is today. I helped start 21C Museum Hotels and build that from a great concept that Steve Wilson and Laura Lee Brown had into an internationally recognized hotel company with over 1,200 employees that started right here and still to this day has its foundations here. More importantly, I love Louisville and I care about its future. When I got in, first started running for mayor, I loved to run. And so I set out to run across all 623 precincts across this entire city. And before the primary election, I accomplished that goal. And in the course of running through literally every corner of the city, I got asked the question often, why are you running for mayor? Well, here's why. Growing up, my sister and I were taught about a concept from our faith that was repair the world. A simple notion that in ways large and small, personally or professionally, we should each try to make the world a better place every day. 
And that's a concept that I really remember my entire life, that Rachel and I have tried to instill in our boys, and that I'm sure all of you all, as Rotarians, with a service-oriented organization that this is, think about and practice every day. And so when I started thinking about my future and what was next for my family, for myself, for my city, this concept of repair the world kept coming back to me. Because right now, if you're anything like me, I think you'll agree that our city's in great need of repair. It's in need of repair, it's in need of revitalization, it's in need of unification, it's in need of energy, it's in need of a sense of urgency to address the huge challenges that we're facing across the city. But when I see big challenges, I see even bigger opportunities. First, public safety. We have to make Louisville a safer city. We need to reduce the amount of senseless gun violence that is plaguing every corner of our city. And I'm sure we'll be talking about our plans to do just that. We need to make, create more affordable housing across this entire city. For those who are homeless, but also for those who are living with family and other friends right now that are struggling to afford a home. We need to improve our education, and I have a plan to create universal pre-K so that every three and four year old child can have the same opportunity to succeed in life that I had. And we need to focus on economic development, creating more good paying career path jobs for people across the whole city, revitalizing our downtown and every corner in between. These may sound like lofty goals to some, but to me, it's our only option, our only direction. Incremental change is not of interest to me. That's also not an option. The challenges are too big right now. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to be your next mayor of Louisville because I think our future is very bright in spite of the challenges that we have today. And we look forward to talking about some of those issues with here today. The one thing I want to leave you with is you're going to hear a lot of promises, a lot of goals, a lot of things that both Bill and I want to accomplish as your next mayor of Louisville. But one thing that's really important to me that we don't hear talked about enough is accountability. You all and everyone in Louisville who lives in Louisville should be holding your next mayor of Louisville, your everyone who's elected, whether they're Metro Council, whether they're in Frankfurt, accountable. We must all be accountable for addressing the challenges that are facing this community with good solutions in a transparent way with a sense of urgency to give these challenges the solutions that they need to make Louisville a safer, stronger, and healthier city. Thank you all so much for having us here today, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you all. Louisville Metro Region is experiencing an alarming rate of violent crime and homicides. What actions would you take to significantly reduce crime, and including gang-related activity? And we will start with you. This is without a doubt the number one issue facing our community is public safety. Some of you all may have heard that recently my team and I had a horrible, unwanted experience with gun violence. After that experience, I might not know why or how I'm still here with you all today, but I certainly know what I'm going to do. And what I'm going to do is have a resolve stronger than any mayor in the history of Louisville before to address this senseless gun violence and reduce the amount of violent crime in Louisville. To do that, we need a comprehensive all-in plan with both short and long-term solutions. In the short term, we must implement in a very robust, energetic way group violence intervention, pro a program that has worked in cities across the entire country to reduce the amount of gun violence where local, state, and federal authorities work with, work with neighborhood leaders, work with members of the clergy, victims of crime, formerly incarcerated individuals, to address those who we know that are committing the crimes, help them have a new option in life, but if not, ensure that justice is served. We must also strengthen our police department. Right now, there are over 300 police vacancies. We need a fully staffed police department that focuses on community policing to help prevent crime from before it happens. I believe we should aspire to have the best police department in America. To me, that means a police department that's trained, best trained, trusted, and transparent. We also need to invest more in the community and the great nonprofit organizations that are providing important mental health resources to our community. 
We need more mental health professionals to work with people throughout our community before crimes happen. And finally, we need to use this once-in-a-lifetime federal funds that are coming into our city to invest in the root causes of poverty. Together, these short and long-term solutions will help reduce the amount of violent crime. And one thing I also want to add is, yes, gang violence is a big challenge in Louisville, and we must address that head-on through the strategies that I'm talking about. But also what goes underreported way too often is that right now, one of the leading causes of homicides in our city is domestic violence. And we need to have a renewed focus on ending domestic violence for those who are abused, but also for children who are living in homes of domestic violence. We need to support organizations more like the Center for Women and Families and others so that we can also end the plague of domestic violence in our city. Thank you. In case y'all wonder why we're all standing up, it's so that the people on the sides could see us. I wonder if I'd be able to see us. Wait a second, just started. <laughs> First I lose the coin toss, now you're beeping me and I haven't even started. Oh, crap, let me tell you. Are you ready? Game balance. It, it's become an accepted practice in our community that we cannot accept, guys. This past weekend, look at what went on. And did we just read the story and then go on beyond our business? As a mayor sitting that has a police department that's been running it for 12 years, we didn't get up the next morning and just say it's an ordinary day. We got up the next morning and we did things. We are doing community policing right now. We, we had two vacancies in Jefferson Town. And we put a call out to have them filled. We had a hundred LMPD that applied for the job that wanted to be a part of J Town. And that's because the leadership of both the chief, Rick Sanders, who will be coming downtown in some capacity with me, and myself, they understand that we allow them to be police officers, but we hold them accountable when they do. So when we talk about community policing, that's a police where the police and the community work together. They look to the future and work together on how to get rid of the gang leaders. We have gang leaders and cartel leaders. And when I talk about Rick, he was DEA in command in Chicago 20 years ago, and he put a list on the wall of 22 of the top gang leaders and got rid of 18 of them within months. That's what you have to do, a unified force of all the federal, local, and state to, to arrest these people and get them out because they are misleading and taking our youth a direction that we do not accept, that we, not, we should not have. So when we talk about GBI, we understand what it means to do it. We're not reading the how-to book. And LMPD wants a leader to show them how to do it, and they're trying as hard as they can. But we believe in a carrot and a stick to, to, on the, the gang balance. We have to have both the strictness of arresting those gang leaders and our cartel leaders and put them in jail, make sure they stay there. But we also have to have the side to help those that should not be in jail. We have to have the, the side where the domestic violence, which we have a domestic violence person in Jefferson Town, that if, if a person, we go to a scene and our officer sees that it's been domestic violence, we have a victim's advocate that goes in and helps that spouse get through the system and get healed and move on realizing that that's not normal. We have the ANGEL program in Jefferson Town, and one thing we don't do, we don't study and study and study. We do, do, do. So as we move forward downtown, you're going to see things that are going to move forward very fast and very frequent. So let, oh, see, you just did me again. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. We love the passion of both these candidates. We could go on, but with time, um, we have to move forward. So homelessness is a top concern. How would you address Louisville's homeless crisis? And this time we'll begin with you, Bill. As I said, as a sitting mayor, we, we deal with the homeless, not in not in the magnitude of downtown Louisville. But we understand the homelessness <coughs> is not something that is just one category. We understand it's human beings and it should not be accepted to move these people from one viaduct to another viaduct. That's similar as everybody keeps hearing me say that that's similar to moving the chairs on the Titanic. The ship is going to sink. We have to have the ability to help these people in all the silos that they are, the reasons why they're there. And as I mentioned before, you have victims of domestic violence. You have a wife that puts the kids in the car and goes and gets out of the, out of the situation she's in, and she needs help. 
That's where we would have the victim's advocate help that person. We have the veteran that has come back and fought for our life, for our community, for our state, for our nation, that doesn't know how to adjust, but is homeless. And we have, in Jefferson Town, we use USA Cares, but there's many other veterans organizations that can help them through the behavioral problem that they have and also help them through the, the homelessness that they have. You have the, uh, the uh, we use the area ministries for those people that are homeless. So many times you may lose a job and all of a sudden you lose where you live and you're living on the streets and you need help. The area ministries are there to guide you through help paying for rent, help paying for utilities, and get you the job that you need. We have a social worker that we use right now that we, we take the person that is on the streets that has the behavioral problems and we get them help. Even though they say we don't want to come off the streets, that is inhumane. We can't accept that. We have to have the ability to work with those people in the future to get them on the streets. Both because we want our community to look fantastic, but also because we want to help the people that are on the streets get off the streets, not just move them to another situation. But you also have a lot of great organizations right now that are helping that we need to empower them to do that, to keep on going and grow larger and larger. Whether it's St. John's or DOA or Wayside Mission or even Habitat for Humanity is building homes for these people. Because in the future we have to have housing for the people to go to. So in order to do that, if we get into a homeless situation, we need to also have housing for the people to move them to where they need to be in the future. Thank you all. Appreciate it. The issue of homelessness and affordable housing is a huge issue in our city. I want to compliment you all, Rotarians, for your leadership in this effort. And the new housing fund that you all have started is an organization that have also seen how important this is to our city. It's going to take partnerships like working the city, working with organizations like you all, working with the Salvation Army, and one of your members here today from the Salvation Army, and the other organizations that Bill mentioned, to address this issue throughout our entire city. Because as you all know, this is not an issue that's contained to one area of Louisville, it's really across the entire city. I encourage everyone to read the article in the New York Times from earlier this week on the city of Houston and how they address the issue of chronic homelessness through a housing first model, with really ensuring that there's enough housing with the support services that are needed to, for those who are homeless. And the great strides that they've made in Houston is a model for what we should be doing here in Louisville. My view, and after meeting with folks from the Salvation Army and many other groups I met with the Coalition for the Homeless and uh, St. John's Center earlier this week, is that we do need more housing. We need more housing for those who are homeless, for those who can't afford a home but are at the precipice of becoming homeless. And we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to do this through the American Rescue Plan funds that are being invested in our community right now. In addition to housing, we need to invest in nonprofit organizations that are providing the mental health resources that are needed, addiction, addiction treatment, job training, family relocation, even services like reuniting families. Was that the buzz or something else? Oh, okay. I thought I, I thought I had to hope I build it, but that was something else. All of these things are working together. I just learned just this morning that over the past year, one organization, one uh, business in this community has had over 1,000 units of affordable housing that they've, that they've planned, that have been approved by our, our planning commission, and have not been approved by our Metro Council. That, we cannot let that happen. We need to make Louisville a city where if you want to build housing, particularly affordable housing, we make it easy to do business here. We support you in this initiative because those of us in this room might be able to afford our homes right now, but there are far too many across Louisville that can't, and all of us in this community, as you all have shown through your leadership and Rotary, have an obligation to help those to make sure everyone in Louisville has a safe and affordable place to call home because that is the foundation of a strong family and a strong life. Thank you. A vibrant city core is critical for a thriving regional economy. What actions would you take to bring more people downtown and revive the city's economy and vitality? We'll begin with you, Craig. Thank you. This is uh, one of the areas that is extremely close to my heart. I spent my career revitalizing urban neighborhoods. From downtown Louisville with 
building 21C museum hotels when people thought we were crazy for building a boutique hotel focused on contemporary art, which was then on the boom dock, dials of seven, all the way out in 7th and Main, to working on rebuilding 111 Whiskey Row after that project nearly burnt to the ground and we and my partners built it back together to supporting other projects in West Louisville and downtown for the New Markets Tax Credit. This is an issue that is passionate, that I'm passionate about, and that I think I can provide a lot of experience and leadership to work with other members in this community to rebuild our downtown. Because a safe, strong, and vibrant downtown is key to a safe, strong, and vibrant city. They must go hand in hand. We need downtown to be a place that everyone in Louisville aspires to live in, to work in, and to visit. And we can do it. This is one of the many areas across our entire city where we do not need any more studies. We all know what the challenges are. We all know what the problems are. They've been the same for over 20 years. And now it's time for action. I have a sense of urgency to get things done. Let's get the city of Louisville out of the real estate holding company business. The city owns so much great property that's just ripe for redevelopment to create mixed-use housing projects with commercial and retail and entertainment and work options. Let's support the current folks who own office towers to bring people back to work, to make downtown the most affordable and exciting place to be if you're an employer in this city. Let's put exciting things on the way too many surface parking lots that we have downtown. Let's make more of the streets two-way to create that neighborhood feel and have the city invest in the needed infrastructure so that we have more green space and more great roadways and more great attributes for pedestrians in downtowns. So that it truly is the center of our city where everyone can come together, where we can work together, where we can play together, where we can visit together, and that when people are coming from out of town, they say about Louisville, wow, that's authentic, that's unique, that's a place I want to live, that's a place I want to come back and visit. Thank you. The number one thing I hear when people talk about downtown Louisville is, is it safe? There's perception and there's reality. And as a mayor, you have, you have somebody that comes to the mic and says, yes, I have made it safe and come down and enjoy our community as you always have because we have a fantastic community. So one of the things that I will do is put a police division in downtown. We don't have a police, we have an administrative division, but we do not have a police division where police are present, whether they're on the bridge area, on the Great Lawn, or walking the streets, or being a part of where you feel safe. We have to make it a perception that you're safe and a reality that is safe. So make downtown where it's a place where you want to come. The next thing you have to have is a mayor that really cares about the looks of your town. How many people say that they drive downtown and they see graffiti all over the place? And then people that have not helped the homeless that we just went through, we have to help the homeless and get them off where downtown looks like a place you want to be. We have to get the graffiti off because the building has to, and the places have to look like a place that you want to go see. And then we have to have the situation where we bring businesses back to downtown. And they go, well, most of the businesses, they had 10 floors, now they're going to five, and I don't know what we're going to do about the other five. I don't accept that. I am one that has one of the largest, well, I have the largest commerce park in the state, and we do not accept that businesses won't come. We started this process uh, six months into the pandemic of attracting the jobs here. We didn't go after the companies, we went after the jobs, move your job here. And if business cuts down to five, story, five stories as opposed to 10, let's take the stories away from Chicago and New York where people don't want to live because of the pandemic. They learned what it was like to not have grass under their feet, not have a community that cares about it, a community that will be safe in the future. So let's do the attraction to downtown that needs to be done. Let's also, as we travel around and with GLI and all the different groups around the United States, a vibrant downtown is a living downtown. So we have to put apartments and housing down there that people want to come live in. There is anywhere from a, a group of people that want to put affordable housing in for the arts program, so that the arts program people, I mean, if you're an artist or if you're an actor, you're starving, and you've got to be able to have the ability to perform your, your art while you're learning, while you're growing. Sorry. <laughs> Following the Brianna Taylor 
shooting, and protest, Global is facing some misconceptions with meeting planners and tourists from being a dangerous place to visit and an unwelcoming place. So how would you change this perception? We'll start with you, Bill. Well, this question is almost the same question we just had just a minute ago, except for there's a huge exception to it. We have to listen to the message that we got from the protests that we had several years ago that is resoundingly still carried forward. We have to take the message that they're trying to tell us to how we can make this community better, where it's all accepting to everybody, and move forward with something, not just talk about it. So as we look to what we have to do, we have to raise everybody in this community to where we're all working together as equals and we're equitably working together. When we do that, we have a community that everybody wants to be at. We have a community that people want to come live at. And it doesn't matter if, if you're black or brown or what, what community or religion or what you are. This is a family. And families should be helping each other. And we have to do this to where, in the future, we look to where the downtown is something that we go as a family and unite, not divide. As I said, as a nonpartisan mayor, I realize what it takes to bring everybody to the table. And anybody that knows me, when I talk about bringing people to the table, I do not use a rectangle table because at a rectangle table, there's always a head of the table. As you notice today, you are at round tables. I always use a round table. At a round table, everybody sits there equally and everybody's opinion is equal. That's what we need to do in the future. We have to have the people at the table that are representing this community to say, this is how we make downtown safe. This is how we realize what Brianna Taylor movement was about. So as we said, how we keep downtown safe, we can go into the, the, the policing part of it, we can go into the cleanness to it, we can go into the, the homeless of it, but we have to listen to what was being said during the protest and re realize that this community has to lift up and help everybody in the community. So we are the example, we are the leader that everybody wants to be in, everybody wants to move in. So, as you look to the future, what Louisville is going to be, it's going to be the place where everybody is welcome. Everybody has the equitable chance to be successful. And when we do that, then all of a sudden the dangerous is not there. It's a place where everybody wants to be and everybody loves their city. Thank you. This is a critically important question about how do we make sure that Louisville is safe and how do we make sure that Louisville is a just community. When I was 13, I was studying for my bar mitzvah and read the passage from Deuteronomy 16, 19 to 20 that begins, justice, justice shall you pursue. As the grandson of two grandparents who fled the horrors of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, those words really was, stayed with me. They stayed with me my entire life. When I saw the protests of last year, they became an even stronger part of my life and will certainly be something that I think about in everything that I do as mayor. Because regardless of your background, regardless of the color of your skin, regardless of your experiences or who you are, we need to bring everyone together in Louisville. And we need to show the world that Louisville is an inclusive city, an inclusive city for everyone. And that takes action. That takes a sense of urgency to make meaningful change right now. So how do we do it? We need to invest in portions of our city that have been overlooked for our entire lifetime. We need to invest in a black-owned bank, invest in more black-led uh, foundations. We need to invest in the nine neighborhoods of West Louisville that haven't seen the needed infrastructure, that don't have grocery stores like we do in the East End or the South End or in the Highlands. We need to ensure, I want to compliment Norton Healthcare, who's represented here today, and their investment in a new hospital. We need even more medical facilities in low-income communities, not just in West Louisville, but in other low-income communities across the city. We need to create a universal pre-K program so that every three- and four-year-old child in this community, regardless of where they live, regardless of their parents' income, regardless of their race, has an opportunity to succeed. These are things that can put Louisville on the map for the right reason. And that's what I'm so excited about, is because right now, while Louisville might be on the map for some of the wrong reasons, we have an opportunity to make meaningful change right now 
with a new administration, with the input and involvement of people in this room and across the entire city, to make Louisville for mo a model for how we become a safer city and a more inclusive city that everyone across the country can see. Thank you. This is our final question. Workforce has been a persistent, pressing issue for the region for some time. How will you increase the college going rates and get more students and adults to receive a certificate or a degree? Complete that, and especially in areas of high demand. We'll start with Craig this time. Thanks. This certainly is critical to our future, is ensuring that not just kids, but also adults have the skills and the resources, have the learning to succeed as we move forward in this ever-changing economy. There are so many different ways to make a living these, these days, and we as a community should be supporting all of them. Yes, we need to invest, continue to invest in organizations like Evolve 502 that provide free tuition for Jefferson County Public School students that are going to Simmons College or UofL or JCTC. We need to work with our labor unions so that uh, people can have more opportunities to learn skilled trades and lead to good paying career path jobs. Invest in programs like Kentucky Out of Works. We also need to invest in our entrepreneurs. There's so many ways. I'm the proud father of a now 19 year old son, but when he was 17 years old, he started a business. People can start businesses at any age, whether they're 17 or 70. And we need to ensure that people have the skills and the resources they need to understand how to start a business. So as we look to the future, there's so many different ways that people will continue. They'll shift careers, they'll have new passions that we want to follow. And so I think it's the city's job to support the private sector, to support Chamber of Commerces across the city, but also to support these workforce development organizations with more resources, and then make them accessible, market them. Because one of the challenges is, so many people don't know what the amazing opportunities in life are. And so we as a community have an obligation to help educate people through schools, through things like the academies and JCPS, but also through just general marketing so that people know of other opportunities that they might be out there so that everyone has an opportunity to pursue a good paying career path job or start a business so that they can provide for themselves and their family. Thank you. And as we look across the, what we want to build for being, we look at the educated, the educated uh, community. And that was one of the key things that we keep talking about during the campaign, safety, economic development, and education. But that first education starts at preschool. And eight years ago, a, another fellow mayor and I started looking at what preschool looked like in Jefferson County. And we realized that preschool is not something that's generic that's put across this community. It's something that can be tailored for each community to raise each kid up. Because as you all know, if a child gets to first grade and they're not ready, we don't have the ability to help everybody in the same way. If that child gets to third grade, if a black male gets to third grade and they are not ready with reading and arithmetic, their destiny is set where they we do not want that in this community. Their destiny is set more for, for jail or gangs, and we don't want that. So we have to be passionate as a group as a community to make sure all kids are ready day one to go into the, the school on um, preschool and first grade. But then we have the academies that go through Jefferson County to teach our kids where, where are they looking? What do they need to do? And if anybody knows anything about academies, it's something great. We're doing something different. In my day, we had the, the schools that taught us a, a trade or taught us a, a vocation, but we never talked to business. The academies actually bring the businesses in and say, how should we train you? How should we do it? And then once they get out, they go to either college, and as a board member of Campbellsville University, I am more on education. I re we realize that when we look to the future, it's a step program. The next generation doesn't want to look at six years, eight years. They want to look at a two-year degree, working on a four-year degree, working on a six-year, and working as a future. But they also, we have to allow them to have a degree in IT, a degree in, in, the, in the trades. And as we look for the training of the, the trade programs, why not look for the homelessness? So let's list these people.